Once your phone is hacked, what is in their hands is not simply your device, it is your future. They're selling our future, they're selling our past, they are selling our history, our identity, and ultimately, they are stealing our power. The screen may be off as it's sitting on your desk, but the device is talking all of the time. The question we have to ask is who is it talking to? If I get a smartphone and I need to use a phone, uh, I actually open it up before I use it. Anything you can do on that device, uh, the attacker, in this case the government, can do. Before 2013, if you said there's a system that's watching everything you do, the government is collecting records of every phone call in the United States, uh, even for those people who are not suspected of any crime, it was a conspiracy. Yes, there were some people who believed it was happening. Yes, there were academics who could say this was technically possible. The world of 2013, we suspected, some suspected that this was happening. The world after 2013, we know that it's happening. The distance between speculation and fact is everything in a democracy. We have now had the first European regulations uh, that are trying to um, limit the amount of data that can be collected secretly and used against populations broadly. Uh, and we have also seen the basic structure of the Internet itself change in response to this understanding that, that uh, the network path that all of our communications cross, when you request a website, when you send a text message, when you read an email, uh, for so long those communications have been electronically naked or unencrypted. Before 2013, more than half the world's internet communications were unencrypted. Now, far more than half are, measured by uh, just web traffic from one of the world's leading browsers, uh, the Google Chrome browser, the entire world has changed uh, in the last few years. It hasn't gone far enough, the problems still exist, uh, and in some ways they've gotten worse. But we have made progress that would not have been possible if we didn't know what was going on. Hacking uh, has increasingly become uh, what governments consider a legitimate investigative tool. They use the same methods and techniques as criminal hackers. And what this means is they will try to remotely take over your device. Once they do this, um, by detecting a vulnerability in, in the software that your uh, device runs, such as Apple's iOS or Microsoft Windows, they can craft a special kind of attack code called an exploit. They then launch this exploit at the vulnerability on your device, which allows them to take total control of that device. Anything you can do on that device, uh, the attacker, in this case the government, can do. They can read your email, they can collect every document, they can look at your contact book, they can turn the location services on. They can see anything that is on that phone instantly and send it back home to the mothership. They can do the same with laptops. The other prong that we forget so frequently is that in many cases they don't need to hack our devices. They can simply ask Google for a copy of our email box because Google saves a copy of that. Everything that you ever typed into that search box, Google has a copy of. Every private message that you've sent on Facebook, every link that you've clicked, everything that you've liked, they keep a permanent record of. Uh, and all of these things are available not just to these companies, but to our governments as they are increasingly deputized as uh, sort of miniature arms of government. What about enabling your microphone camera? If you can do it, they can do it. Uh, it is trivial uh, to remotely turn on your microphone or to, to activate your camera so long as you have systems level access. If you had hacked someone's device remotely, anything they can do, you can do. Uh, they can look up your nose, right? They can record what's in the room. The screen may be off as it's sitting on your desk, uh, but the device is talking all of the time. The question we have to ask is who is it talking to? Even if your phone is not hacked, right now, you look at it, it's just sitting there on the charger. Uh, it is talking tens or hundreds or thousands of times a minute to any number of different companies uh, who have apps installed on your phone. Uh, it looks like it's off, it looks like it's just sitting there, but it is constantly chattering. And unfortunately, like pollution, uh, we have not created the tools that are necessary 
for ordinary people to be able to see this activity. And it is the invisibility of it that makes it so popular and common uh, and attractive for these companies. Because if you do not realize they're collecting this data from you, this very private and personal data, um, there's no way you're going to object to it. Once your phone is hacked, what is in their hands is not simply your device, it is your future. But we see how these same technologies are being applied to create what they call the social credit system. If any of your activities online, if your purchases, if your associations, if your friends are in any way different from what the government or the powers that be of the moment uh, would like them to be, uh, you're no longer able to purchase train tickets. You're no longer able to board an airplane. You may not be able to get a passport. You may not be eligible for a job. You might not be able to work for the government. Uh, all of these things are increasingly being created and programmed and decided by algorithms. And those algorithms are fueled by precisely the innocent data that our devices are creating all of the time, constantly, invisibly, quietly, right now. Our devices are casting all of these records uh, that we do not see being created, that in aggregate seem very innocent. You were at Starbucks at this time. Uh, you went to the hospital afterwards. You spent a long time at the hospital. After you left the hospital, you made a phone call. You made a phone call to your mother. You talked to her until the middle of the night. The hospital was an oncology clinic. Um, even if you can't see the content of these communications, the activity records, what the government calls metadata, which they argue they do not need a warrant to collect, um, tells the whole story. And these activity records are being created and shared and collected and intercepted constantly by companies and governments. Uh, and ultimately it means uh, as they sell these, as they trade these, as they make their businesses on the backs of these records, what they are selling uh, is not information. What they are selling is us. They're selling our future. They're selling our past. They are selling our history, our identity, and ultimately, they are stealing our power and making our stories work for them. If I get a smartphone and I need to use a phone, uh, I actually open it up before I use it. I, I perform a kind of surgery on it to physically desolder uh, or, or sort of melt uh, the metal connections that hold the microphone on the phone. And I physically take this off. I remove the camera for the phone and then I close it back up. I seal it up. And then if I need to make a phone call, I will attach an external microphone on it. And this is just so um, if the phone is sitting there and I'm not making a call, it cannot hear me. Now this is extreme. Most people do not need this. But for me, it's about being able to trust our technology. My phone could still be hacked. My laptop could still be hacked. And just as I told you before, the same principles apply to me. If it is hacked, they can do anything to the device that I can do. Uh, so my trust in technology is limited.